you. I want to welcome you all for this Gyan Proof on Empirical Methods in Legal Research, which is organized by Center for Criminology and Victimology at National Law University, Delhi. It is supported by Asian Law Institute, Faculty of Law, National University of Singapore. I want to welcome Professor William Hubbard from Chicago University. Professor, thanks a lot for coming and giving your time for this uh, program. <laughs> Professor William Hubbard received his JD with high honors from the law school in 2000, where he was executive editor of the Law Review. He clerked for the Honorable Patrick, Patrick E. Higginbotham of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit. From 2001 to 2006, he practiced law as a litigation associate at Mayor Brown LLP in Chicago, where he specialized in commercial litigation, electronic discovery, and appellate practice. From 2006 to 2011, he completed the PhD program in economics at the University of Chicago. Before joining the faculty in 2011, he was a Kaufman Legal Research Fellow and Lecturer in Law at the Law School. Mr. Hubbard currently serves as an editor of the Journal of Legal Studies. He teaches courses in civil procedure and has been an organizer for the Law and Economic Workshop. His current research primarily involves economic analysis of litigation, courts, and civil procedure. Other research interests include family, education, and labor economics. He has extensively published on various aspects of legal education and research. I hope you have all received the schedule of the program. Yes. Like, uh, it will be a five-day program, and on the last day, there will be a discussion, and in the evening, there will be an exam. So, for the purpose of getting the certificate, you all have to sit for the exam and on the basis of that you will get the credit. And uh, right now, I think, Professor, we can start? Wait, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, welcome. And thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, everybody, uh, for uh, joining me here today. Thank you very much for this opportunity to share a conversation about empirical uh, legal studies methods and legal research. And, um, uh, very much appreciate the opportunity um, to be with you uh, here this week. So I passed out some index cards. Um, uh, I figured it would be fitting to begin uh, a course on uh, empirical legal studies by doing a little bit of uh, data gathering uh, myself. So uh, if each of you have an index card, uh, if you could please just uh, note, you can just use the letters A, B, C, and D if you want, um, how much of a background you have in empirical uh, legal studies. Uh, this course assumes no knowledge, so if you have uh, no knowledge at all, uh, that's fine, that's where we will begin. Uh, but uh, some of you may have much more knowledge in empirical uh, uh, research, and I'd, I'd be interested in that as well. Um, and also, uh, please, uh, if, if, you, if you can, uh, you don't have to, you can be completely anonymous, but uh, you could note if you are a student, a professor, or a researcher, and what your interest in empirical legal studies is. Are you interested in doing your own empirical legal research? Are you interested in, in simply teaching the subject? Or are you simply interested in uh, understanding what others, uh, other researchers, uh, what their research uh, might mean uh, for you? So if you could um, please just take a moment to, just, uh, just one minute, just one minute to jot down. Um, and I'll collect the cards, and that'll be my own empirical empirical research for the day. Excuse me, can we have the whole card? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I, if, if you could, everyone could just keep one card and then pass it, pass it along. Um, <laughs> or interruptions at any time, especially if there's something that you simply don't understand or needs clarification. Uh, you should feel uh, welcome at any time to, uh, to raise your hand with, with a question. Uh, or, of course, please feel welcome to save your question for the discussion session. Uh, but but uh, there's, there's, no need to, uh, uh, there's no need to wait uh, if you have a question right away. I'm happy to take questions as, as we go along. Has everyone had a chance to jot this down now? So 
when you're done, just um, just pass your cards towards the this side of the room, and we can we can pick them up. And I'll, I'll I'll take a look at them. What I'm going to do is you've uh, I hope you've all received the, the schedule for the uh, the course, the five day course. I have an outline of the material that will be covered each day in the course. However, I um, I'm happy to adjust the material based on uh, based on your feedback and uh, and what uh, um, and what we're able to cover each day. Thank you. I've taught uh, empirical legal methods uh, for uh, people who have no background at all. I've taught empirical legal methods to people with PhDs in economics, so uh, I'm happy to adjust uh, to adjust my teaching to to, uh, uh, to anyone's level of uh, of interest. Okay, so uh, without uh, without further ado, let me just give a a, a quick outline of, of the course uh, and say a little bit about myself, and then we'll begin with uh, with the course material. So the way the schedule is structured, as I mentioned, is a two-hour lecture followed by a one-hour discussion session. Um, I think we'll maybe have a, a very brief uh, break just to stretch our legs after about uh, an hour each day, and then a break after the lectures. Um, uh, and as I said, please don't hesitate to, um, uh, to ask questions. I will, uh, on the schedule, you'll see assigned uh, readings for the following for the following day. So there are three papers for tomorrow, there's one paper for Wednesday, uh, and so on. Um, we will use those papers as an opportunity to uh, discuss specific work that's being done, empirical research that's being done, that relates to the topics that were covered in the lecture uh, each day. The papers are a mix of studies that are focused on uh, the Indian judicial system, uh, as well as some papers that, um, that myself and some other American uh, scholars have done uh, on, the, uh, on the American legal system. OK, um, I, I won't repeat the, the introduction, uh, except to note that uh, I do have a background uh, training both as a lawyer and as an economist. Um, and I've, I've practiced law for some years, uh, but now as a professor, my research focuses on, on the empirical study of law, specifically on courts and lawyers, um, although I also do some, uh, some doctrinal and theoretical research as well. Uh, and then on Friday, we'll be talking about some of the work that I'm currently doing, actually, <coughs> currently studying uh, on the Supreme Court of, of India uh, with, with co-authors, including uh, Professor Aparna. Uh, Chandra uh, here at NLU. Yeah. Okay, so uh, overall the goals for this course is to really begin with fundamental um, uh, fundamental ideas in empirical legal research, uh, but the emphasis on this course is going to be on uh, methods of uh, causal inference. In other words, how can we learn from the data how the world works? What, what, what causes uh, the, the things, uh, things to change in the legal system. How does the legal system cause change in society? Um, and we're going to focus on uh, practicing reading empirical papers and, and uh, learning how to understand and digest them, but also how to, how to criticize them, how to understand the weaknesses and the limitations of empirical work as well. Okay. Um, so today, what are we going to talk about today? Well, today we're going to begin with some uh, fairly uh, foundational topics. Uh, we'll define exactly what we mean by empirical methods, uh, identify different empirical methods. Uh, we'll talk about uh, the specific role that um, methods from economics will play in empirical legal studies. And then we'll focus uh, most of our time on discussing the uh, correlation and causation and uh, the difference between the two. Uh, correlation does not imply causation. We'll talk about how we can uh, develop skills for identifying when the correlations that we see in data actually tell us something about a causal relationship. Um, and then if we have some time, I don't know how fast we'll, we'll go today, so uh, if we have time, we'll begin uh, by talking about some of the concepts, basic concepts from statistics. Uh, but if not, tomorrow we'll be devoted to introducing some important concepts from statistics. Okay, any questions before we get, get started? All right. um, so, uh, why study empirical methods? Maybe, um, uh, maybe there's no need to uh, maybe there's no need to discuss this uh, 
uh, question since all of you chose to be here. Uh, I guess you all have, have good reasons uh, for, uh, for this. But I think it's important to recognize uh, some of the ways in which empirical methods are useful in law, but also some of the ways in which empirical methods aren't, uh, are not useful in law. So why study empirical methods? Well, facts matter, uh, obviously. Um, and specifically, when we think about the law, uh, oftentimes we'll talk in very uh, normative terms. We'll say, look, we need to change the law to do this. This law is bad. This law is good. Uh, we need to change this law or keep this law. Um, but a lot of those discussions, even if we don't articulate them, depend upon some sort of factual assumption, some assumption about what's actually happening in the world, what effect the law is having on people. And it's that factual, um, uh, the, that set of factual assumptions that, that is important to the judgments we make about the law. But we can't know whether those factual assumptions are true or not uh, unless we test them empirically. And so that's, that's in, in my mind, the single most important uh, a reason for uh, empirical legal studies. This is my, one of my favorite quotations uh, uh, it's actually uh, etched in stone on the buildings, uh, on one of the buildings of the University of Chicago. Um, uh, when you cannot measure it, when you cannot express it in numbers, your knowledge is of a meager and unsatisfactory uh, kind. Um, that might be overstating it a little bit, uh, but I think that captures this, the, the importance of, of being able to, to measure what it is uh, that we're talking about. Okay, so what we have here, uh, also, here's another reason. This is kind of the second reason why we might care about empirical legal studies, uh, which is we have theories, not just normative theories, right? Theories about why law is good or why this law is good or that law is, is good. But we also have positive theories. In other words, we have theories about how the world works. Um, theories that try to explain the way the law actually works in action, not just the law in, on, on the books. And so, uh, lawyers, legal scholars, but also economists and political scientists develop these theories that are theories of how the world actually works. You know, what influences uh, case outcomes, judicial decision making, how legal rules affect society, how legal rules affect uh, the behavior of lawyers, um, how legal doctrines change over time, and so on. Um, all right, so we have these theories, um, but of course, um, uh, and these theories are useful, right, because they allow us to predict the effects that law might have before we actually implement the law. They allow us to make judgments about how change should occur. All right, that's their value. Um, but, of course, a theory may be nothing more than a theory. It may just be a conjecture about the world. It may not, in fact, be, be accurate. And so we use empirical legal methods to verify the accuracy of theories. That's kind of a second uh, useful aspect of, of, um, of empirical legal studies. So here's the, maybe the most famous example of this. Um, uh, when I was uh, a, an economics student at the University of Chicago, I had the, the great privilege to be a student of, uh, of Gary Becker, the Nobel Prize winning uh, economist. And, and one of the, the seminal contributions uh, to, um, uh, to the study of criminal law uh, was his work in the 1960s. Now, before uh, his work in the 1960s, the prevailing view in the United States about the nature of criminality uh, was that there was simply a criminal mindset, that people had some sort of mental uh, condition that made them a criminal, and this was unchangeable. Uh, Becker introduced the idea that criminal behavior followed the laws of supply and demand, and the idea there is that if you increase the punishment associated with crime, criminals would be deterred. They would commit less crime. That was the idea. And importantly, these are two theories that generate different empirical predictions. Right? One theory says if you increase enforcement of the law, there will be just as many crimes. You might catch more criminals, but there'll be just as much crime. The other theory says if you increase enforcement of the law, there'll be less crime to start with. So these are different empirical predictions. And by looking at data on crime, we can determine which theory is, is right. And by, looking, and by looking at the data and determining which theory is correct, we can then make judgments about the law. For example, we might say 
uh, we shouldn't invest more resources right, in jails or in judges or in the police if it's not going to decrease crime. So on the other hand, maybe if it will decrease crime, we should invest more resources. That depends on many factors, not just this. This is just one factor. Um, but that's uh, an important factor. That's an important factor. Oh, by the way, I, I forgot to mention at the beginning, um, if any of you are interested in uh, having copies of these slides, I'm happy to share the slides <coughs> with you, send you a copy of the slides by email. Um, so please, you, you know, you don't have to worry about uh, 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 writing, uh, writing things down on the slides as, as they come up. Uh, but of course, feel free to do so if you want. Uh, okay, um, and finally, so, um, and then I think the third main thing that empirical legal studies are valuable for is even if we, we've tested a theory and we believe the theory is correct, we might just want to measure magnitudes. How big is the effect? Is the effect a bit small or is the effect big, right? And so, um, and this matters for policy too. It could be the case, for example, that uh, let's say we, we agree that um, Yes, if we have more punishment, it will deter crime. If we, if we put people in jail for longer, that will deter crime. Maybe that's true. But it matters a lot for policy whether the deterrent effect is small or big, right? Because jails are expensive. They have uh, costs on, on society. They have costs on, on, on the offenders and, and, and their families and so forth. So if the effect is small, maybe we don't want to do it. If the effect is really big, Maybe we do, and so, but measuring the size of the effect is something, obviously, that ultimately can only be answered empirically. It can't be answered theoretically. It cannot be answered um, just by looking at, at legal doctrine. Okay, so those are the main ideas, I think, uh, that motivate, that, that justify uh, empirical legal research. Now, there are, to be clear, many empirical methods, many different empirical techniques um, that are used. Uh, there's no way uh, in a week or even in a year I could uh, cover all of them. Um, and different fields take different approaches to answering empirical questions. Uh, empirical methods are prevalent in almost every field of scientific and scholarly and humanistic inquiry today. Uh, obviously, in the physical and biological sciences, engineering, medicine, psychology, uh, I'm sure all of you are familiar with that. But it's important to note that fields like sociology, anthropology, and demography uh, are increasingly using quantitative empirical methods. Economics and political science, of course, are becoming increasingly empirical in their approaches. And even fields like linguistics and literature are becoming increasingly empirical. There's some very interesting work, uh, quantitative empirical work being done on linguistics and, uh, and literature these days. Um, having said all of that, I'm going to focus on economics. I'm going to focus on economic methods uh, that, uh, for empirical study. Um, the reason for this is uh, twofold. One is I'm an economist, and that's what I'm best qualified to teach, so that, that seems like a good reason. Um, but secondly, the methods of economics are especially useful for legal studies, and that's partly because, uh, like economics, legal studies is about humans, human behavior and human institutions. Not just individual people in isolation, but human institutions, courts, uh, markets, the government, uh, uh, society. And so in that respect, the, the methods that economists have used for empirically studying these topics are particularly useful for studying the law. OK, um, now, I mentioned earlier that one of the, the, the main uh, points of emphasis in this course is going to be understanding causal relationships, cause and effect. Um, and that's a primary goal in much of the empirical research that is being done in law today. Um, okay, so here are just some examples. There are many, but these are just some examples. Uh, so do changes in legal standards of proof change how often plaintiffs win? Uh, so we might think, well, look, should we change this this rule, should we have a beyond a reasonable doubt standard, a preponderance of the evidence standard, a clear and convincing evidence standard? But will that even make a difference? In theory, it should make a difference, but empirically, that might be an interesting question. Um, uh, here's something from uh, the economics uh, and the law of employment. Um, 
does preventing employers from asking about criminal records increase the hiring of disadvantaged minorities? So I, um, I, I, I don't know if there's a comparable example in India, but certainly in the United States there are uh, racial and ethnic minorities that have historically been uh, disadvantaged. And one of the things, uh, sources of disadvantage, if you look at, for example, uh, African Americans in the United States, is they're uh, much more likely to have a criminal record. African Americans are much more likely to have a criminal record uh, than, uh, than white Americans. And so many legal reformers had said, maybe employers don't hire African Americans because they, they have criminal records. And so what we should do is we should prevent employers from asking about criminal records and see if that actually increases the employment prospects of African Americans. So that's the theory. Empirically, is that true or not? Um, and I'll show you some. Uh, I'll show you some empirical research uh, in the next couple of days um, that reveals that this proposal actually reduces the hiring of African Americans. And so, um, this is a, an example of, of empirical research that has shown that something that is a very popular theoretical idea actually turns out to be a really, really, uh, a really, really counterproductive uh, policy proposal. Um, do laws requiring changes in the structure of corporate boards increase firm value? So in, in corporate law, in, at least uh, among uh, the, uh, the, the law professors I hang out with, this is something a lot of them like to discuss, is um, corporate governance. Does, does structuring the board of directors in a, in a certain way um, improve the quality of corporate governance? Is it better for shareholders? That sort of thing. But ultimately, those are empirical questions, and, the, and there's a lot of empirical work that studies this. And importantly, this is a causal claim, right? Will changing the structure of the board of directors cause the firm to have higher value? Right? It's a causal uh, claim. Okay. And then, you know, here's a really big question. You know, these are all small in comparison. You know, just creating new legal rights does it change society? Right? I mean, these, these are big questions. I mean, not, you know, any student of the Indian Supreme Court is going to encounter this question, right? Because of the the, the tremendous role that the Supreme Court of India um, has had in terms of um, defining right, the scope of the, uh, of the rights embodied in the, the, the Constitution. Okay, so um, you'll notice um, I have uh, some words in bold. So those are you know, sort of the, the, the words that you may not be as familiar with, and so I, I'm trying to kind of define these terms along the way. Um, so the ones in bold are just the words I'm trying to define. I'll try to give definitions. If you don't uh, understand, you know, if these are uh, these terms, if I haven't given a good definition, uh, you know, please just ask me to to explain to explain further. Okay. So econometrics is just um, it's just the, the term for the study of empirical mathematics and economics, and uh, and it's very much focused on this this thing that uh, economists call causal identification kind of a strange term. I don't know why we call it that. Uh, but I guess it's identifying the causal effects. So we call that causal identification. And so sometimes if you, you know, happen to uh, uh, you know, be at a workshop with economists talking about empirical work, they'll often say things like, oh, but is your model identified? Or you know, is your methodology identified? Well, this is what they mean. Have you shown that the correlations in the data reflect a cause and effect relationship? So that's what we're going to be spending a lot of time focusing on. <coughs> Economics as a field, in the last 20 years or so, has undergone a very radical transformation from being a science, a social science, devoted primarily to the theoretical study of human behavior, to a social science focused almost entirely on empirical questions, and specifically cause and effect questions using data to answer questions about cause and effect. And so um, I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll start going through some examples very soon that'll make this much more concrete, but this is just the, the high level background. Okay, so what's the, the, what do I mean by the fundamental problem of causal inference? Okay, so let's just um, get some terms out, out here so we're, we all have the same uh, terminology. Um, so I'll talk about treatments and I'll talk about outcomes. Okay, so treatments and outcomes. So we observe something happened to people. There's something changes in the world. There's a new law. There's a you know there's a there's a natural disaster. Um, you know the a new government gets elected. Anything. Some something happens in the world 
um, that, uh, that potentially affects people. Okay, so some treatment happens, and then we see some outcome. Something that we care about, you know, a person's income, whether they win or lose a case, right, how long they live, right, some outcome, something we care about. And so the question is, does the treatment cause the outcome? Okay, that's the basic idea. Does the treatment cause the outcome? Does X cause Y? Now, in order to prove with certainty that X causes Y, what we could do is we'd create an alternate universe where X never happens. Right? So in one universe, X happens. In an alternate universe, everything is the same, except X doesn't happen. And then we ask, does the outcome still happen? Or in this alternate universe, does the outcome not happen? If Y happens anyway, then we know something else caused it. But if Y doesn't happen, then we know that X was the cause. Okay, that's the idea. Now, what is the fundamental problem of causal inference? We can't observe alternate universes, right? We can't create an alternate universe. We only have one universe to work with. And so what basically what economists like myself and what empirical legal researchers spend a lot of their time doing is trying to figure out how to determine whether the treatment caused the outcome when we only have one universe uh, to work with. Okay. So far, so good. Any questions? Well, plenty of time for discussion at the end, but don't don't uh, uh, hesitate to interrupt. Okay. So now, just to um, more terminology, types of empirical data. Right? There are many different types of empirical research. Um, qualitative and quantitative. Right? And so quantitative, obviously, anything that can be put into numbers. And qualitative is uh, data that's just not uh, not numerical, not necessarily in categories. Right, so for example, uh, interviews, right? You have an interview with somebody. You, you do a case study. You uh, examine uh, some person's experience or some lawsuit. Um, you look at archives uh, and primary materials. A lot of these things can't be reduced to numbers and categories, uh, but it's still data, right? It's still information about the world. <coughs> and then there's quantitative data, right? Uh, there could be surveys. It could be interviews that ask quantitative questions. Uh, you know, surveys. Uh, you know, how long have you held your current job? How, what is your current um, uh, income? Have you ever been involved in litigation? How many times have you been involved in litigation? Um, experiments. Uh, we, we, many or all of you may be familiar with experiments in terms of health and medicine or, or physical sciences, maybe psychology experiments, and maybe even experimental work on, on the law. And we'll talk about some of that. And then there's observational data, and this, this is a term that requires uh, a little bit more explanation. What do we mean when we say observational data? Well, we kind of mean anything that isn't an experiment or a survey. Um, it, it's a bit of a catch-all term, but it means quantitative data that already exists. Right? So I'm not doing an experiment to generate data. I'm not going out and interviewing people to generate data. I'm simply finding information that's already in, out in the world and collecting the information that's already there. So, uh, for example, uh, the census, right? When the government goes and collects information on how many people they are and where they live and if they're employed or not, right? That's observational data. We're not doing an experiment where some people were giving them jobs and some people were not giving them jobs. They just went out, people just got jobs so they didn't get jobs. That ex that we had no effect on that. We're simply observing. Uh, what has already happened. Okay, so that's the idea of observational data. You're just observing what's already happened. And um, most of this course is going to be devoted to observational data, to its limitations, but also to the ways in which observational data can be used for causal inference. Now, think, if you think about it as a lawyer, say you're like me and you want to study the courts. You want to study litigation. Who wins, who loses, how long do, do, do cases take? It's hard to run an experiment uh, on that, right? You can't uh, uh, take people and, and have them, you know, and, and say, oh, uh, you're going to file a lawsuit and you're not going to file a lawsuit. Let's see what happens. Uh, instead, you have to use the lawsuits that just happened, that, 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 that already happened, uh, the lawsuits that um, have already happened in the world. And so that's observational data. Uh, it's not experimental data. But there are limitations that observational data has that experimental data doesn't have. Uh, and we'll talk about that uh, in just a moment. Um, 
Uh, and so we're going to spend a lot of time thinking about ways to design studies to overcome them. Um, now, having said that, you might ask, well, my goodness, uh, if it's so hard to use observational data, why bother? Why not just, I don't know, why not do a survey? You know, if, you, if you're worried about whether um, some law is going to have some effect on people, why not just ask people, is this law going to have an effect on you, right? That, that seems reasonable. Why not just rely on surveys? Um, well, uh, the, the, the short answer is, well, sometimes we do. You know, we can always ask people. That's, that's, that's certainly one of the options that we have. But sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes it's not the best option. So consider this example. Uh, uh, so let's say you're, you want to do a study, and you're, you're in the United States, to kind of continue this employment example from before. Um, and um, you interview, uh, you do a survey of employers in the United States, and you ask them, uh, when, you're, when you have a bunch of applications, people applying for a job, um, how likely are you to favor a white applicant over a black applicant? I'm guessing a survey is probably not the best way to answer that question, right? Um, you probably want to use observational data or an experiment, but uh, not a survey, right? Because look, um, yes, yeah, sometimes the best way to find out what people actually do is just ask them, but sometimes it's actually not the best way to find out what people actually do, especially if it's a question about hypothetical behavior or if it's a sensitive subject, you know, like, like race. Um, so, people may not know what their true behavioral patterns or tendencies are. The answers may be strategic, may uh, affect an, a, a desire to influence the researcher or at least not to look bad in front of the researcher. Um, depending on the nature of the question, people may not have enough time to respond. Um, they may not take the question seriously because there's nothing at stake for them, right? They, they're, you're asking, oh, how would, I'm going to describe a law to you. How would this law affect you? Well, somebody might really think about it, but somebody else might not really think about it. And even if they do really think about it, they might not know how some law that they've never actually experienced will affect their behavior, right? It's hard to know. Um, so all of these reasons are why, even though interviews and surveys are a very important part of uh, empirical uh, legal research, there are many situations where uh, it's not good enough just to ask, where you need to use some of the methods. Well, what about experimental methods? Uh, you know, for those of you who, who, uh, who looked at, you know, uh, you know, like medicine, for example, you know, they do experiments, right? They give half the people randomly get the medicine, half the people randomly get a placebo, and you repeat these studies and you determine which medicines work. And there have been huge advances, huge advances in health and medicine over the years. That seems like a really good model uh, to follow. Um, and I guess the first thing I'll say is yes, it is a really good model to follow. And we'll, um, on Wednesday, we'll spend, I think, a lot of time talking about experiments. And in many ways, experiments are the gold standard uh, for empirical research, whether it's by economists or, 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 or doctors or lawyers. Um, but, um, but, there's always a but, um, but consider, uh, consider this example. So this is a famous example. This is a, this is a real example. This is um, uh, a, a, a well-known type of experiment. Um, it's called a dictator game. Have you all heard of dictator games or in behavioral economics or behavioral psychology? No, OK, OK, this is, uh, this is new, good. Um, so there's this whole area of experimental research in psychology and economics, trying to understand um, the psychology of how people interact and ways in which people may behave that do not reflect, um, shall we say, the, the, uh, the stereotypical economic rationality, right? So often economic theories assume that uh, people will behave in a way that maximizes their money well. Uh, and nothing else. Now, we, don't, we know that's not really true, um, but the question is, well, what is true? What is true? And so this empirical research tries to understand how different things like social norms, uh, beliefs about fairness, altruism might affect how people uh, maximize their wealth relative to other people. 
So this famous game, dictator game, says, look, uh, you bring two experimental subjects in here, and you randomly pick one to be the dictator and one to just sit there and do nothing. And they're very disappointed because they don't get to be the dictator. Uh, but what the dictator gets to do is they get all of the money, but they decide how much to keep and how much to give to the, uh, to the poor fellows uh, sitting across the table from them. Uh, so in these ex experiments, they're generally given you get $10, uh, 10 US dollars, or something like that. Um, that's about uh, 600 rupees. Um, and uh, and you, one person divides the money, and that's it. That's the end of the game. So there's, there's no consequences no matter what you do. You can keep it all for yourself. You can give it all to the other person. It doesn't matter. That's the end of the game. Um, now, the selfish prediction was that people keep it all themselves. Uh, but what these experiments find is that usually the money is split about 60, 40, 70, 70, 30. So you keep a little bit more for yourself, but it's pretty even between the two people. <laughs> and so when these studies are published, and I've, I've read them, um, they have this uh, very triumphant tone that they have disproved the economic theory of rationality. Because look, when people have money, they're so altruistic, they'll share 40% of the money they have. Okay, what's the problem with these experimental results? And why might we think that an experiment isn't better than observational data in the Because it's not like, uh, I mean, there are controls in the interference as well. They might want to appear to be altruistic. Yeah, so the other person or the researcher, yeah, it may be kind of like the, the problem with the survey we discussed, is, is if you know you're being watched, you might want to look good, right? And, and I mean, think about it. How many times have you had, uh, you know, 600 rupees in your pocket and just given 200 or 300 of them to just a random stranger sitting across from you? Anyone, has anyone ever done that? I haven't. I'll admit it. Um, and yet you see people do this all the time in laboratory experiments. <laughs> That's a little odd, right? So you can probably do what you were saying, right? Um, and so this is another example of the situation where, yes, experimental designs are the gold standard for empirical studies, but it depends on the details. It depends on the nature of the question you're asking, how you set up the experiment, and whether there might be problems like the problems we've identified. Okay? So that's why sometimes, even though observational data has plenty of its own problems, we'll spend a lot of time talking about them, um, uh, there are limitations to every kind of data. That's really the lesson, uh, the lesson that I'm just trying to, to, to recognize uh, right now. Okay. So as we said, many topics cannot be studied in the laboratory setting. I'll give you other reasons why we can't do laboratory experiments. Oops. I'm going back. Sorry. Uh, here we go. Um, so, for example, what's the effect of torture or malnutrition on people? Uh, you're not going to do that in an experiment. I just hope you're not going to do that in an experimental <laughs> setting. Um, you, know, uh, you know, but if there is a famine, you can collect data on the famine and see what happens. You don't want to cause a famine. That, that would be a problem. Okay, and then there are practical limits. What if you want to study the effect of having a completely different system of government? Well, you can't do that in a laboratory setting, right? You, you have to use observation. Um, and as we discussed just a moment ago, a major concern for experiments is what is called external validity. So what does external validity mean? Well, the opposite of external validity is internal validity, as I'm sure you could have guessed. And the idea of internal validity is, um, is the, the um, conclusion you reach from the data true for the data itself? And external validity is, even if it's true for the data itself, is it true anywhere else or just in this one little setting, right? And so experiments tend to be have high internal validity for reasons that we'll discuss. That's the whole point of an experiment, is to have high internal validity. But they often have low external validity, which means just because it happens in the lab doesn't mean it happens anywhere else. And that's the, that's the big issue with experimental work in law, which is why um, the economic approach to experiment is much more valuable than, say, the, the phys physics or chemistry approach to experiments. Because molecules behave the same everywhere. Doesn't, they don't know they're in the lab, but human beings do know they're in the lab. And that's why experimental work is less, is sometimes less effective in the lab. 
human behavior depends on social and legal context. Um, subjects may try to appease the research, as we discussed. And sometimes the stakes may be too low to induce realistic behavior. Right? So for example, in these dictator games, people have rerun these dictator games in different settings. And what you find is if you give somebody a dollar, they'll split it 50-50. If you give them $10, they'll split it 60-40. If you give them $100, maybe 90-10, right? And, and you know what I mean? So it, the, the stakes matter too, right? The matter. Um, OK. All right. Uh, any, any questions? How are we doing for time? Uh, oh, we're doing good. Okay, great. All right. Um, all right. So let's. Now we're getting to the to the to the to, to the meat of today's topic, which is causation and correlation. Okay. So not everything we're going to talk about in this course is going to be about causal inference. But a lot, a lot is. Okay. Um, all right. Correlation. All right. So just make sure we're defining terms here. So it's a relationship between two variables. And just to be clear, what I mean by variables is just any quantifiable thing that can have different values, right? Okay. So correlation is a relationship between two variables uh, such that higher or lower values of one are systematically associated with higher or lower values of the other. So for example, I said here age and income. Uh, so if you use, again, you know, I know the US data best, so I'll, I'll mention US data. So if you look at actual US data, if you look at people ages 20 to 50, um, their income rises uh, as their age rises. So income rises as their age rises, uh, by a lot, actually. Um, a couple of things. So this is a correlation. It's a correlation between um, uh, two uh, continuous variables. Uh, what do I mean by continuous variables? Uh, what I mean is uh, these are variables that can take any value, any value. You can get a little bit bigger, a little bit smaller. You know, you can have, you can be age 50, you can be age 51, you can be age 50 and a half, you can be age 50 in a day, you can be age 50 in an hour. Uh, so these are continuous variables. Um, and it's a positive correlation, right? So one goes up, the other goes up, right? That's positive correlation. Okay. Um, now, here's, here's the kicker, though. Here's the tricky part. Um, is this a causal relation? It's a correlation. There's clearly a correlation. The data make it clear there's a correlation. Is it a causal relationship? And if so, which direction? Does being older cause you to have higher income? Maybe. Does higher income cause you to be older? <laughs> That's not right. That's not right. Um, or is it that some there's some other more complex relationship between age and income? Right? Maybe neither one causes the other. Like if I just sit around waiting for time to pass. My income's probably not going to rise. On the other hand, if I get a, a raise, I'm not suddenly going to, if I make, get a huge raise, I'm not going to suddenly become a lot older. Uh, and so it's probably a different relationship altogether. So this is an example of a relationship that is a strong correlation. You'll see this correlation if you look at, at any time in any society, you'll see this correlation, at least for these age ranges. Um, but, the, but the causal relationship between the two is quite a bit uh, more complex. Um, it could be um, that being older, if you're working, means you're getting more experience. And getting more experience is actually what's causing, right? It's experience, not age, that's causing the, the, um, the, the income to rise. So that's the idea. That's the basic idea. Another example, this is a negative correlation. What's a negative correlation? Well, that's just when one goes up, the other goes down, right? So that's negative correlation. Uh, and so here we see the relationship between whether or not you have a college degree and whether or not you smoke. And what you see is having a college degree is negatively associated with smoking cigarettes. Probably true um, uh, outside the US as well. Um, and notice this is a correlation between two dichotomous or binary. <coughs> what do you mean by that? Well, college degree is a yes no, right? So yes or no. Do you smoke, yes or no? Now, if you wanted to turn this into a continuous variable, you wouldn't say college degree, yes or no. You would say, well, level of education or years of education, right? If you wanted to change smoking into a continuous variable, you could say number of cigarettes smoked per day or something like that would be a continuous variable. But whether or not you smoke at all is a, is a binary or dichotomy. So just to get the terminology. Um, OK. Um, and then, you know, again, we can ask this question again. What's the causal relationship? And here, 
it's it's tricky as well. Um, so does going to college cause you not to smoke? Well, maybe actually. Um, does smoking cause you not to go to college? Well, maybe actually. Um, you know, if you're if you're a smoker and you otherwise would have gone to college, but now, you know, you. you you read the, the news reports, and it's like, well, I'm going to die young, so <laughs> might as well enjoy life rather than going to college. I don't know. Uh, maybe, maybe there's a causal relationship there. I don't know. Um, uh, or it could just be that there's some other third factor right, that, that is, mediates the two, that affects both of these, and they don't actually directly affect each other. It could be, for example, um, you know, people who um, are interested in scientific knowledge are more likely to read about smoking and say, oh, I shouldn't smoke, but they're also more likely to want to go to go to college, right? Um, or it could be that, you know, uh, it depends on who your friends are, you know, and uh, if you make, uh, 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 you know, if you go to college and you're surrounded by, uh, you know, people who, who say it's not cool to smoke or something like that, uh, then maybe maybe the effect is, is, is uh, works in any way. I don't know. I don't know. But but the important point here is you have a very strong correlation, and the correlation helps you start thinking about, wow, this is a strong correlation. Maybe there's a causal relationship. But of course, it doesn't prove a causal relationship. We don't know which direction it goes. Or maybe it goes both directions. Maybe it doesn't go either direction. Maybe it's just a coincidence. Um, okay, so let's get out the first handout. Um, uh, did you guys get a handout? Um, oh, yes, yes. Go back to the... Yeah, yeah. Then we analyze the quotation. How do you take care of mediating and, med um, uh, mediating and moderating variables? Like smoking, age, age and income. Yeah, right, yeah, no, that's the question. Uh, yeah, that's, that's the, like, Wednesday through Friday of the course, but actually tomorrow too. Um, so yeah, that, that's the question. How do you, how do you separate right, the, the different factors that may mediate the connection between uh, uh, smoking and smoking? Um, or maybe they don't mediate the connection. Right? Maybe um, there's no connection at all, except that there's some other factor that just influences both of them separately, but they're not actually connected to each other. If there is no such connection, how can we say that there is a correlation? If a particular instance took place, there's another instance. Okay, we try to predict that there is a correlation, but it may be incidental. If there is incidental only, that means there is no correlation. Uh, the core, like uh, Professor Pan has asked a question regarding that mediator and connector between two variables. There are two variables and there, there would be obviously some mediator and the connectors. If there is no such mediator and connecting agents, then how can we say that there is a correlation? It is merely an incident. A correlation is just a, it's just a statistical relationship. Okay? It's a statistical relationship, meaning that if you have many uh, data points uh, that have a high value of one variable, those data points tend to have, if it's a positive correlation, a high value of the other variable. Um, that's just a, a statistical fact. It could arise uh, for at least three different uh, reasons. One is there is a causal relationship between the two. You know, X causes Y or Y causes X. Uh, two is there are some some mediating factors that that indirectly connect the two, or that uh, there's some third factor that causes each of the two things separately, but they don't cause each other. Third is it could just be a if it is the coincidence only, so how we can say that there is a correlation? Obviously, but, you know, but if a correlation just says if one thing happens to be higher, the other thing, on average, happens to be higher as well, and sometimes that just happens by luck. And I'll, I'll, I'll um, so there's a famous example. There's several famous examples of this. So, um, uh, uh, so in the United States, now any fans of American football, NFL fans? No? No. Uh, so, American football in the United States, the, the championship is called the Super Bowl, right? So, you've heard of the Super Bowl. And so, um, for a period of about 25 years, at some point somebody noticed in the, in the late 1990s, they uh, looked at data on who won the Super Bowl 
the Super Bowl's in January. Super Bowl's in January. Um, looked at um, who won the Super Bowl in the January of each year, and whether the stock market went up or down that year. And what they found was a, a, a near perfect correlation, 96% accurate uh, correlation between um, the, there's two, there's two uh, conferences, there's the National and the American Conference and the National Football uh, So if the National Conference won, the stock market would go up. The American Conference won, the stock market would go down. There's no causation there. That's just a coincidence, right? But, but if things are randomly happening, just by random chance, you sometimes get very, very strong correlations, right? which again, is just a, a statistical relationship. Even though there's no connection, there's no connection between the two things. Um, so uh, uh, I'll, I'll, um, I, I don't have it with me, but I'll, I'll uh, see if I can look it up on my computer tonight if I can remember. Um, there's a whole website devoted to correlations that are 95% accurate um, as a correlation between two things that are completely, uh, you know, completely uh, unconnected. We'll talk a little bit about, what do we talk about? Well, if, we might have some time today to talk a little bit more about this, but if not, we'll talk about it later. later. But importantly, a correlation is a, is a mere statistical fact. It simply says, when you look at this group of data points, they tend to kind of be higher in both categories, or they tend to kind of, one tends to be higher, the other tends to be low. Um, there could be no reason but, but blind luck for that to exist. That, that's, the, that's the key. As a statistical matter, there could be literally no connection. Um, or it could be a mediated connection. Or it could be a direct connection. It could be any of those things. All right, so let's look at. Uh, you know, so, yeah. Can we rely on this kind of correlation where there is no connect, connection, even though two factors are, are happening together? I'm sorry? As a researcher, can we rely upon these kind of situation and the correlation where there is no direct relationship, even though two phenomena are happening together? I mean, that, that is the fundamental problem of causal no, inference. Especially exactly. for, for academic research or from sincere uh, uh, academic concern, can we rely on these kind of correlationship? And the answer is it depends. And the, the, the whole point of this course is to talk about how to look at the data and make a judgment as to whether we think there really is a relationship, or if it's a mere correlation, if it's literally just. If, if, we, if we think about the reliability, validity, standardization, <coughs> I think we cannot move ahead until unless we are able to establish the relationship. Yes, there is a relationship. One is dependent on other, or both have some kind of interface yeah. relationship. No, that that's exactly what well, that's exactly what we're here to here to talk about. That, that we're gonna, don't worry, we will spend the rest of this week answering that question. Especially in the context of dependable and variable. Yes, yes. We will definitely, we will talk about, so we'll talk specifically about that. Uh, uh, probably not today, we'll probably get to that tomorrow. Okay, so did everyone get this handout? Um, the path to millennial, happiness to millennial man is good. Do you have a chance to read it yet? Um, so just take a chance to read. Just take a, a minute or two to read it. Um, and ask yourself, um, what are the causal claims being made? In this, this is a news article about CNN. It came out a couple of years ago. Um, based on US data. Um, but as you read this article, just ask yourself, what are the correlations being reported? Uh, and what are the causal claims being made? When is somebody saying that X causes Y? Okay, so just, just take a moment to read. Uh, take a break. Two minutes or whatever. Actually, you know what? This is a good time to take a break. Why don't we take a break for five minutes, read the paper. If you need to stretch your legs, stand up, stretch, that's fine too. We'll just take five minutes, uh, read the paper, uh, stretch your legs, take a drink of water.